Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Blizzard Watch Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Rossi. With me this week are my two fantastic co-hosts, uh, Joe Perez and Liz Harper. Uh, Liz is the EIC and overall editorial director of the site, and Joe is just the guy who does everything involving these podcasts, and I'm just the babbling guy who babbles. Uh, we basically got quite a few things to talk about this week. Um, I thought I would throw in a question up front first, and we could talk about that really briefly because it's a very depressing answer. Um, so here it is. This one's from Wellfire. Maybe something that doesn't really fit in, but you did for some time account for how long Blizzard didn't recognize unionizing. Uh, do you know how it is looking now? Uh, and as far as I know, the answer is they still haven't. Because uh, they Activision recognize- still hasn't. They recognized the Raven Union in June, but we still haven't heard anything about it. And I don't believe the like the big part of Blizzard has actually taken further steps on unionizing. Yeah, I mean, part of the whole deal with Microsoft acquiring Activision Blizzard was that Microsoft was actually recognizing unions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I now mean, that that's not necessarily a thing that will happen. Oh, go ahead, Liz. And Activision did say it was going to recognize it back in June. So uh, it's just we haven't heard anything else, and union contracts can take time to note to uh, negotiate and ratify. And uh, often big companies will drag their feet on setting up a union contract, and they'll just drag out the negotiations so they don't have to do anything, basically. Yep. <laughs> uh, so I have not heard anything, and there have not been further, you know, pushes to do that sort of thing. And of course. A lot of people see Microsoft as the good guy here. Microsoft has crushed unions before. Oh, yeah. There time. was, yeah, there was a very similar thing at Microsoft maybe six or seven years ago, maybe a little while ago, that uh, QA workers, uh, a branch of the QA department was unionizing and, you know, Microsoft just eliminated it. Yeah. So, okay, well, you want to unionize. Well, we don't, we, we guess we just don't need you if you want workers' rights and things like that. Uh, in this case, kind of a big company is there are no big companies that are friendly to unions and the bigger the company, the less friendly they're going to be. So yeah, I, past, I don't know what the future is here. The past 50 years in the United States uh, in particular, although all over the world to some degree um, has been one of corporations consolidating and growing in power and not unions be, being basically vilified in so many different ways as a straight up corporate attempt to, to get rid of collective bargaining. That collective bargaining is the thing that companies hate the most of anything that they hate. They hate the idea that their workers can get together and say, hey, our work has value and we're going to prevent you from, from profiting from it and we'll prevent you from just firing everybody and hiring more people to do the same thing. This is something that they hate. So there has not been any good news on this front. Uh, Joe, I know you know a lot about this kind of thing. So do you have anything you want to add? I do. Um, just at the end of the day, remember, and, and for anybody who's listening, that is uh, considering, you know, whether they should join a union or things like that. Remember, you're selling your labor at the end of the day for the work that's being done. The company is buying your labor. And if you uh, want to get a fair market rate, sometimes you have to renegotiate. Uh, so that's what these people should be doing. And I hope. I hope that we start to see more of more movement on this uh, and actually get to start to see some unionization like happening and being recognized and things moving forward. Because at the end of the day, all these people make our games, right? Those executives sitting in the, the suites at the the top of the dad that are the little towers. They don't make the games. They don't do any of that. In fact, half the time, I don't know what their value is, but the people making the games, yeah, they should probably be paid enough to, you know, like live and pay bills and be treated like human beings and not have to work crazy hours. So, you know, unionize. So, yeah, that's that's basically us covering that. So now we're going to move on to them. their top stories that we like talking about. And I wanted to do this one as Liz, Liz is the one who reminded me of it. But then I remembered that Liz is the one covering it to some degree. Liz, Mythic Race, you've been you've been doing streaming for it, right? Uh, yeah, I've been doing some casting for BDGG for the Mythic Race. And. This is actually a pretty crazy mythic race because we have uh, both uh, Liquid and Echo are on Razageth right now. Echo was just an hour behind Liquid on getting to Razageth, and both of them, their best pull has gotten Razageth down to uh, 64.8%. It's like a fraction of a percent off that these two guilds are. And of course, we had uh, 
as of this recording, we had the US reset today and Liquid is going through and re-clearing, collecting more gear because it feels like at this point, it's like an item level thing. They need more item level. And then we've got Echo is probably going to do the same thing tomorrow. Go back in, try to get gear, try to get enough item level to where they can kill Razagath because this is a really, really tough fight. Do you think that and the then, race was affected by the fact that they didn't have a free week to do the splits and, and gather as much gear as possible before Mythic came uh, out? Absolutely. It meant that every guild doing World First spent uh, three, two or three days collecting gear because they still had a week worth of gear collecting to do. It's just they no longer had a week to do it. So it was kind of, it was this compressed schedule. And I don't know if that's good or bad. It's definitely not very fun to watch uh, as they just do the same content over and over. Uh, the big guilds did four or five or six or seven, like four to eight splits, you know, trying to gear up all of these characters and gear up different characters. And the new uh, loot system also affects it, right? Uh, yes. I mean, basically the new loot system lets the master loot gear. And what a lot of the big guilds have been doing is they, you know, they kill the boss, they trade all of the gear to one character, they log that character off. And then when they're done with their splits completely, they look at what all those characters have and who's going to make the best use out of it. And they log that character on and trade it back because the trading, you know, when you get a piece of loot in a dungeon or uh, you can trade it to other people for like a certain number of hours, I believe it's two, two hours. hours. Yep. And that, that pauses when you log off. So they can trade it. And then when they're done with everything, they can look at, okay, who's got what? Who's going to give us our best chance and give them the loot, like really direct it in that way, as long as they were in that original raid. So they have been really min-maxing here. And it's been really interesting to watch. And then at the slightly lower level of the raid, we have both BDGG and Method at uh, Broodkeeper Diurna, and uh, they got their, uh, BDGG is doing World 3rd right now, and they got their uh, method is kind of trailing them, but they're maybe six or so hours behind. And of course, you have the same thing going on there as you do with Liquid and Echo, is that you've got a pretty close race, and today BDG is re-clearing for gear, and tomorrow Method is probably going to do the same and try to catch up. So it's it's really kind of anyone's race right now because it's so close at the top end. And that's it's been really fun to watch. And is that related? You're the one that reminded us that there's also being some nerfs to Mythic rating at this time. Uh, uh, there, there have been quite a few, both uh, nerfs and buffs, as they've like adjusted things as they've gone through. Um, they changed something just yesterday, I think, where uh, movement effects that prevent you from being moved will prevent or prevent you from being knocked back will prevent you from being ooh it's something like that Razageth has something where she tries to throw you off the platform and there were bugs around that to where you could use a, a movement effect and it like you would still get knocked off the platform so they've adjusted how that works and that has made death knights really powerful they have some we they learned have that last talent. night <laughs> yes, they have a talent that means you can't, you Rel know, basically throw them around. What was it like and Relentless Death March or become, something like that? Yeah, and that's become like really important in the Razagath fight. Uh, blood decays have been brought into tank most of the Broodkeeper fights. Uh, well, we've only seen two guilds kill Broodkeeper so far, and both of them had Blood Death Knight tanks because of that healing, because they need that much healing. We've also seen every guild from Kurog up at least take five healers. Five healers is a lot for 20 players. And, but these fights are just that rough. They demand so much healing. You cannot throw in an extra DPS and out DPS those healing requirements. Well, and it's real it's quick, been a wild race. Real quick, yeah. like, there's, there, there's a, and maybe because you, you've seen more of the fights now, especially at a higher level. I think maybe the healing part of it is also that there requires so much more movement now than a lot of the previous, like several tiers of rating for a lot of these encounters. Like I'm noticing it on just the first few bosses. Uh, what about the, the the ones that you've seen? Like I, the amount of movement there. Like, do you think that's playing a factor in why they're going to five healers? 
Uh, it could be, it could be, uh, they're also using a lot of evokers and, you know, evokers have a lot of movement. Evokers can just jump across the battleground. I and mean, when I'm saying evokers, I mean, preservation evokers. We've seen a few DPS evokers, but a lot of guilds are running two preservation evokers in their healing team. They're well, uh, they're, they're very so strong right now too. They're very strong and they're also very mobile and, uh, their rewind ability, which, just undoes half of the damage you've taken in the last five seconds. That's a crazy cooldown. So when you take some big hits, and there are a lot of big hits that can just smack the raid down, you get your evoker to hit rewind at the right moment, and bang, you aren't back at 100% health, but you're doing a lot better. Uh, so I think evokers have kind of changed up the race a little. And yeah, there's a lot of movement required on all of these. There are a lot of knockbacks. There are tons of things to dodge, just kind of an outrageous number of things to dodge. I can't, when did we have a raid tier last that had just so much going on that you were constantly dodging around? Throwing Even a thunder. Joe, Joe and I are doing normal right now, and it's just, it's kind of nuts how much is going on. And of course, yeah, we just uh, did this the race... second boss in normal. Mm -hmm. uh, I just did that fight last Thursday. Mm -hmm. And my God. <laughs> There is a lot. If you get this thing, you can get rid of these things if you go over next to them. But don't <laughs> stand next to this thing. I'm like, oh my god, I can't even see half of this thing. These things, have, yeah, there's up there. Um, so it's it's been really fun to watch. It's been really fun to see uh, Blizzard adjusting on the fly. I'm curious to see if they're going to keep adjusting things as the race for, continues. I feel bad for discipline priests. Uh, you know, I have seen some discipline priests. Um. No, but I mean, I'm just looking at this Razageth thing. We fixed an issue where Discipline Priest Atonement was incorrectly being affected by both the damage increase and healing increase from the Focus Charge buff. Uh, I bet you most Discipline Priests didn't even know that that was happening, and now they'll never get a chance to, to experience what that feels like. I feel bad for them. Uh, yeah, there's just a, there's a lot going on. It's a little crazy right now, and uh, yeah, I want to see what happens next. Well, cool, and that's, you know... I was the original thing I had mentioned was actually talking about Mythic Plus in general, uh, because we've also seen some changes to Mythic Dungeons. Uh, quite a few of them are getting some some reduce reductions to damages or damage you, from the abilities or actually health of various things that you fight. Uh, one example is the Overgrown Ancient. Um, the Ancient Branch's health has been reduced by forty percent. Uh, there's other changes like the Conjured Lasher's health is reduced by twenty percent. The arcane tenders infused ground damage is reduced by 33%, stuff like that. So it seems like the Mythic Plus may have been a little overtuned. Because, um, you know, as you go up in difficulty, of, of course, you know, as you as you go up to like, you know, like two, four, six, eight, uh, the things get harder. So I'm, I'm interested to see why, you know, part of it is like, we have a question that talks about this later in the show, so I don't want to go too much into it right now. But looking at the, the dungeons that are not... This expansion dungeons like Court of Stars, the Halls of Valor, uh, and um, Temple of the Jade Serpent. The changes, they, it seems like a lot of this is just straight up, oh, we didn't realize this would hit that hard. So what do you guys think? Have you been doing any Mythic Plus dungeons? I've done like a couple. Uh, a little bit, but only at lower levels. So I haven't, you know, I haven't gotten to the point where it's difficult enough that I really run into stuff like that. I did Azure Vaults on, uh, I think, uh, with a two, like a plus four keystone, and uh, we did we did die a lot. Uh, the first couple of pulls were not good. The trash was just nasty in place. So I'm looking at all these various damage and health reductions on all these various mobs, uh, and Azure Blade gets a gets a ton of reductions, and I think it's probably a good balance. Um, Joe, have you? Done any of them yet? Yep, I've gone through all of the dungeons uh, at various levels at this point on Mythic um, and Mythic Plus. Well, I shouldn't say Mythic Plus. I'm still we're still working through keys, but uh, while I can see the balancing as being necessary, because you got to think about it, right? And we talked about this, I think, when they first announced uh, what the uh, dungeon plan was going to be for Mythics. That there was probably going to be rounds of attunement or adjustments and tuning it up because those dungeons haven't been touched in quite a while at a, a speed level. So with everything that happened with the cl the classes being reworked, the talent system being reworked, um, new balancing, new gearing, new uh, 
breakpoints and gear to actually reach and 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 get to, they're going to be adjusted. Especially the older the older content, they're going to have to move those up and down. So basically, I'm getting what I would expect out of it. I don't think that they're hitting uh, nearly as bad as some might make it out to be, but definitely need to be tweaked. And I can see that they're doing that, and it makes me happy. Alrighty. Um, that kind of leads me to kind of talking about stuff that's just, you know, straight up news. Uh, this week, LFR availability for, for the, uh, vault of the incarnates is, is available. You need item level 359 to do it. So you basically need to be kitted out in what? That's heroic, isn't it? 359? Yeah, it's heroic dungeon gear. Uh, so you need heroic dungeon or, uh, the, the primal storms, the, the elemental storms gear to get in the door. You need, you know, you could have like a slightly better one thing and a slightly worse the other, but that's the general average. Um, so if you want to do LFR, that's available. I think it's the first three bosses. Yeah. Uh, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing about LFR for that set, that council. Like, Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> good luck to you. So they, they have not included council in this. First oh, thank bosses, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean, Ar- Aranog, Taros, and uh, Delthea, Dathia. I'm interested in that because Aranog is very much feels like a DPS check, and I don't know how it'll feel on LFR. I think Aranog um, is less of a DPS check. I think, uh, what is it? Sin- uh, I keep calling it Frost Nope because I that's I always pick a nickname <laughs> for a nickname for uh, a boss, and I completely forget their real name. This is how this works. The Spider Boss. Um, that that I think is the the DPS check. Personal opinion. I mean, the spider boss also requires a lot of coordination, a lot of movement, a lot of not flying off the platform, a lot of ice physics. Whose idea was it to add (laughs) ice physics to this game? It is not an improvement. This makes me crazy. (laughs) And uh, like so far on our attempts, we just we work. We've been working on this and it's just ice everywhere. It's terrible. Uh, I mean, I'm sure. We'll get used to it. We'll get used to it eventually. It's just, it's, this is, this is a mess. There's a lot more going on than DPS. And of course, if you're sliding around on the ice, you're probably not DPSing. Yep. But you know, <laughs> that's, that's interesting to me. If you want to do it, I, I almost queued up for it today, but then I realized the podcast was about to happen. I didn't want to be even trying to wrangle LFR and be doing the podcast at once. So yeah, um, didn't do that. Also the Feast of Winter Vale started last week, I believe on the 16th. And it's so since today is the 20th as we're recording, it's it's going up till January 2nd. So if you haven't d- taken part in any of it yet, the Christmas trees are still in the various capital cities and you can still go get the Grinch, I think. It's the Grinch, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you can do that if you want to. I don't don't have anything new to add about that. But I will mention um, Dragonflight patch 10.0.5 is now on the PTR. I mean, I don't know if the PTR is open yet, but I know I downloaded it. I believe so. Um, there you go. Um and that's a big patch for a 0.5 patch. Um, there's a lot of changes. If you're a druid, two of your specializations are just getting straight up completely redesigned. If you're a guardian druid or a balanced druid, everything will be different. Your entire talent tree will be completely different. They are changing the whole thing. Uh, I thought that was more guardian and feral, not balance. No, it's according to the notes I was just reading, it was balance. But, you know, I don't know about feral. Uh, maybe they're doing them too. Uh, I don't know. A lot of talent changes for other classes too. Like arms is getting a significant talent revamp. Um, a few others are too. I forget. I think one might be hunters. Uh, but I can't remember on that. Uh, I, when I look at patch notes, guys, I look at warriors. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, that's what I do. I'm like, Oh, anything good for warriors? Not really. Oh, okay. Or Hey, arms is getting some changes. Maybe it'll be viable. That'd be good. Cause then I won't have to spend twice as much uh, re- to get two weapons as everybody else does to just get one. Um, but yeah, there's there's a ton. The trading post is is on the is in the uh, the works, and of course the best change of all time. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let both Liz and Joe talk about what they want to change, or what they were looking forward to seeing before I go about what I think the best change is. So, Liz, what do you think the uh, what are you most interested to seeing from this patch? Um, I mean, I'm really curious as to how the how the trading post is gonna work out, how that's gonna play out in practice. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I think it's cool that we're getting some items we couldn't get before without, you know, paying anyone money. Like the Celestial Steed is there, which used to be in the store for $25. And now you can get it, at least on the PTR, I think it's 900 coins, which you get 500 coins for just 
logging in, you get 500 coins for a month and uh, you can earn another 500. So that's going to be, you know, a bit of an effort, but it's like this used to cost $25. Now you can just log in and play the game. You get, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, there, there are also a few holy paladin changes that I'm, I'm looking forward to checking out, which, uh, you know, I'm a holy paladin. So like you zone in on warriors, I zone in on paladins in the patch notes. Uh, like there's, there's a really interesting one that will give us a chance to generate holy power based on our target's current health when I cast on targets with out beacon of light so basically non-tank targets whenever i heal someone with like a hard cast heal i have a chance to generate holy power which is really interesting because it'll give me more ability to generate holy power at range which is the big problem the class has oh, is that the one where on... yeah okay i'm looking at that's tower of radiance right yeah yeah, I have been paying attention to Holy Paladins because I do eventually intend to get my Paladin up to heal. I like this one because it's it guarantees the rate to 100% once the target's below 50% health. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I feel like this is almost, you know, when, when stuff goes into that, oh God mode, when you have to start healing like a lunatic to keep people alive. It's like, yeah. now at least it will benefit you in some small way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the problem is, of course, this is for Holy Light and Flash of Light. Holy Light is a 2.5 second cast time. Flash of Light is 1.5 seconds. Both of them cost an absolute mountain of mana. Flash of Light costs 22% of base mana. There is no other heal any healer has. There's no other simple single target heal that any healer has that is that ridiculously expensive. So you can't do that for very long. <laughs> but I like I like having the option because we like Sinarth Spider, this horrible spider boss. It can be hard to stay in melee when there's ice everywhere and spider webs everywhere and you're sliding on the ice and you need to run up the stairs and also Sinarth is trying to pull you off the ledge so you got to run away and you're out of melee range. Uh so I think that's just interesting. That could give us more opportunities. I don't know if it'll play out into being quite that awesome as it is in my mind, but I'm interested in seeing. What do you think about the Avenging Crusader, Jane? Uh, I do... Hmm, Avenging Crusader now costs five holy power. Well, I've never run with Avenging Crusader, and it's like five holy power is a lot of holy power. And like I was just saying, um, like if you're... When you're having trouble... Well, Avenging Crusaders, basically, that's your kind of DPS healing cooldown. You hit it, and then your DPS is translated to healing, as long as I'm not confusing that for another ability, because all Paladin abilities have these similar names. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so looking it, at it here, it says, you become the ultimate Crusader of Light for 20 seconds. Crusader Strike and Judgment cooldown 30% faster and heal up to three injured allies for 250% of the damage they deal. I mean, yeah, it, but it costs five holy power, which is your whole entire holy power bar mm -hmm. instead uh, instead of 50% base mana, which was still really expensive, but holy paladins don't use a lot of mana. You could afford that because you're not, you're just not, you don't have a lot to do with your mana. I think five holy power is a lot more difficult to afford, uh, but... It's now on a 45 second cooldown, meaning you could use it very frequently. Mm -hmm. So that might play out in interesting ways, but that's another ability that really relies on you being in melee. And particularly with all these movement heavy fights that we're seeing in Vault of the Incarnates, that's that's tricky. That is hard. Yeah, that's fair. Anything else before I move on and ask Joe? No. Nope. Okay, Joe, uh, anything you've noticed that you really think is interesting? I mean, besides the trading post, there's really not much for me in this particular patch. Uh, not even the healing tide change? You mean the one that doesn't affect anything except for outside of combat? Yeah. That yeah, one. yeah, yeah. So I'm still... Padilla's in chat, and uh, I'm on the same page as Padilla. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I understand that it's it's going to be a thing when it happens, but I'm really hoping that Restoration Shaman uh, talents and playstyle gets... A look at because we can it's too easy to fall behind especially like we were talking about this a little bit on the pre-show evokers are real strong right like they're they're super strong right now um and, it, and 
And also, Joe and I's guild leader has re-rolled a preservation evoker, and now we have to compete with that. Not it's only unfair. that, not only that, but uh, like for an example, I'm not exactly a slouch when it comes to healer, right? You, you both have been in a raid with me at some point. Mm-hmm. You, you've had me as a healer. You know, I, I know what I'm doing. Uh, and not that stop doesn't, but like he's a brand new evoker. My gear level was 25, 30 eye levels higher than him, and he was blowing me out of the water, barely trying. Like that shouldn't happen (laughs) like it that's just insane to me so i'm hoping that they're going to take a look at other healers in general restoration shaman i do think needs another look uh resto druids are very very powerful right now which they were already in a good place um but they're not as powerful as evokers so we'll see i'm not i don't want this to turn into me complaining it's just i really want to see some more love given to restoration shaman because it's Padilla put it best. We were given, or for up until this point, we kind of had a bunch of DPS skills that fed into our healing. All of those have sort of been stripped away, and nothing has really replaced them. And as a result, like we either heal till we're out of mana, and then we're just kind of done, and then we everybody else keeps eclipsing us, or we maybe throw a lightning bolt, and there's nothing else to compensate for it. It's a really tricky spot to be in. I am hopeful that it'll get looked at and and they'll take feedback and they'll they'll take another pass at it because it we shouldn't uh, be falling that far behind Liz, well, and with uh with weekly restarts uh restoration druids got all of their healing increased by five percent so yeah. there you go five percent five percent flat across the board yeah which i'm really happy for them i would love to see some of that <laughs> Here we are. I mean, one of the things that I have noticed about Resto Druids is that my Resto Druid is out DPSing me now, and that's that's really embarrassing when I'm playing a Holy Paladin, but I'm having a ton of trouble staying in melee range for very long because I'm moving around all over the place. And, uh, you know, these straight caster classes can do things from range. It doesn't matter where they are on the battlefield. And uh, that's what I'm blaming. I'm blaming encounter design. It's not because I'm a terrible paladin, even though I'm not a great paladin. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. Why are Resto Druids so good? Maybe it's just our Resto Druid is like really super good. Maybe it's a little both. I don't know. Rose is is pretty good. (laughs) But yeah, no, it's they I'm looking for I'm looking forward to more class tuning. How's that? That that's that's the positive way I can say it. So nothing else on your radar? Nope. Liz already got the trading post stuff, so I'm already looking forward to that. Oh. Then I will bring up the uh, absolute I'm- best change. The best change for the entire patch is that white and gray items will now be transmogable. Mm-hmm. Uh and and that needs to be that's something they promised us, I think, six months ago. Back when they were talking about the uh the Zareth Mortis uh, patches and stuff. And then it didn't happen. And then it didn't happen on Dragon on Dragonflight launch. So this is a really good change. Uh, basically, what happens is all that white and gray items that drop in your in, in your inventory, if you equip them, they will become they're now going to be bind on equip. If you equip them, you can now learn their appearance through transmog. You then have to sell them to a vendor. You can't put them on the auction house or whatever. Um, but right now all you do with them is send them to a, sell them to a vendor anyway. So basically you'll get the exact same benefit from them that you do right now. Plus you'll get to transmog to them, or you can put them on the auction house and let someone else buy them. Uh, but don't do that with the items from vendors. I mean, come on guys. Uh, how, but I'm just, I am super excited for the incredible plain Jane transmogs I'm going to come up with. Uh, there's just so much weird stuff that we could transmog for now. I don't care about the twill set, but I know people will. <laughs> I know there are going to be t- dozens of, of casters in twill. Uh, for for like the other thing is, I'm wondering like some stuff won't be available to classes you'd think it would be because it's no longer their armor type. Like a lot of like the old male stuff that I used to use as a warrior up until level forty is is now just always hunter or always shaman yeah it's not, some people some people forget yeah. like you you were one armor type before you were the other in a lot of cases like hunters yeah, I, hunters I, wore leather before they wore male so did uh shaman yeah and i think yeah warriors and paladins wore uh male than plate i think you, you mentioned hunters yeah. and, and shaman already uh i think that like the leather classes actually some of them might have worn cloth i'm not sure on that um I should I never played one. I know Hunter. I know Rogues didn't. Rogues started in leather and stayed in it. Druids might have too. I don't know. 
Uh, but I also know that like, I'm really hoping that this is going to be a step along the path to finally maybe relaxing on armor type restrictions for transmog because I, I get that you don't want people rolling need on a, on a piece that isn't something they're actually going to use just because, so they want to get a transmog thing on it. But I feel like it's time that cloth wearers get to use plate if they want to, you know, like if you want to have your battle mage fantasy, then, then let them use some plate. I don't know. It just feels silly to me that, that we still have this restriction. So I'm, that's why I'm looking forward to this as a chain, as a first step along the path to getting transmog. Finally, just say, do what you want, go wild, come up with the, whatever crazy outfit you like, use that pitchfork. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm personally very excited about this one. I know both Liz and Joe hate transmog and won't oh, say anything yeah. good about mm. this. Yeah. Liz is the only person I know who probably has more plate pieces than I do. Oh no, I know Matt Fawson. He, he probably has more. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> Matt Fawson gives both of you a run for your money, I think. I, oh, I, I, I raid yeah. with Matt, so I'm fully aware that the dude has a lot of gear. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, anything else on this one before we move on to something else? I think I'm good. Liz? No. All right. Um, this one, I feel like we kind of have to mention and it's it's sort of it's an interesting thing to to find out. Uh, you guys remember Chris Metzen in most cases, although he's been gone long enough that some of you might not actually know who he is. Uh, but Chris Metzen was for years essentially the creative director behind World of Warcraft and anything else Blizzard did. I think by the time he retired, he was senior vice president in charge of creative development. Yeah, something like uh, that. I think that was his title. Yeah, but it was an announcement last week. I think it happened just after we did the podcast because, of course, it did. Um, that Chris Metzen was coming back as um, creative advisor. I believe the title they're giving him. Yeah. Creative advisor of a uh, of franchises or whatever. Yeah. It's a pretty so, broad title right now. I think he's mostly working on Warcraft. And then after that, he may move on to something new. Uh, John, John high. I can't pronounce how to spell. I don't know how to pronounce this man's name. John height, J- whatever Do you guys know. Do you know how to pronounce John Height's name? Is that how I pronounce it? Are you talking about uh, H-Y-A-T-T? H-I-G-H-T. H-I-G-H-T. I think it's just height. All right. Well, uh, he basically said, you know, this is re- just reading him. Uh, it is with great joy that I announced Chris Metzen has joined the Warcraft leadership team as creative advisor. Chris's focus initially will be on World of Warcraft. Then his work will expand to other projects across the, the Scrawling franchise. Chris was one of the original team members working on the Warcraft universe back when it began in 1994. And we are so happy to be reuniting him with the world he helped create. So that's, you know, basically that's what he'll be doing. Um, we don't know what his other projects are. Uh, or what they will be if they I, it felt like i remember saying at the time that it felt like they were wouldn't bring him back to just work on franchises that already exist uh so it's quite possible he'll be working on something else there's a there's that survival game that we don't know anything about that's supposed to be a new ip though so mm-hmm. yeah. yeah don't really know and and yeah i mean it's a big deal i mean this is a guy who was huge uh he was basically you know even his mistakes became content. Uh, when he forgot the Draenei origin and the Eridar origin, he made up a new one accidentally, and it ended up being what it is today. The Draenei are what they are today because he had forgotten what he wrote in the Warcraft 3 manual. Uh, and he, he copped to it. You know, I, yeah, I forgot that. But He literally did. I remember that. That was a, yeah. that was a wild thing. It was, it was that BlizzCon he said it, didn't he? Yeah. He just straight up said, yeah, this is on me. I forgot. I forgot I wrote that. So, yeah, we're going with the new stuff because I like it. Uh, so yeah, that's, that is a thing that happened. Um, there's also, I, I feel like it's being disingenuous not to point out that the guy was also voice actor on like at least three characters. Uh, he did thrall. That's the big one. He also often did vary in Rin when they couldn't get the guy who they had actually hired to do him to come in for something. Uh, Metzen did him about half the time. And I think he also did nefarian. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. He, he was nefarian. Yeah, I believe so. Uh, so Yeah. Uh, um, he's been doing thrall even since he left. He did. Th- they, they did get somebody else to do thrall's voice a couple of times when he couldn't come in, but he, he did thrall's voice in a, in a battle for Azeroth. Um, the specifically, I remember that specifically the Sorfang cinematic where he went and got thrall. That's, that's Chris Metzen talking. I, I do. I feel like it's sort of like I'm avoiding an elephant in the room, not to point out that he was also a high level executive during the time period where a lot of people we're, we're having significant troubles with sexual harassment. And whilst no one has ever accused him of anything, to my knowledge, no one has said that he did anything to anyone. He was in charge when stuff was commonly known about quite a few people. Like Alex Afrasiyabi was working right with him 
and apparently being very horrible if you look at the allegations made. So it's, I do feel like you have to at least mention that. You have to you acknowledge that that is the truth um, when he is coming back. Uh, it's not something I particularly feel comfortable saying, but sometimes you have to say things that don't make you. So I'm hoping that there won't be anything like that here, that he is going to come back and it's going to be fine for everybody involved. Uh, you got anything else to say, Joe, before we move on? The title of advisor uh, is probably what gives me at least, I don't want to say some hope, but like reduces some of the trepidation at least because I don't think he's going to be directly in charge of anybody. Um, I just want to make sure the, the, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this uh, properly. Um, it's one of those things where I really like where the story has been going. I like a lot of the things that have happened in a post Metzen world. I just want to make sure that some of that, you know, that that keeps going. Right. Um, that's all. That's where I just hope that we keep seeing the, the creative strives for representation and, and, uh, interesting storytelling that we've been seeing continue to happen. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I think what else we have to talk about? Um, we talked about the race of war first, right? Yeah. I always have to go back and look at this thing and make sure we talk about this <laughs> stuff. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, yeah, we got that. We got that. Yeah, we got that. So yeah. Okay. We've covered everything and we can move on to some emails now. Uh, if you guys have a question for, for this podcast or indeed any of the 317,000 podcasts we seem to be doing, um, you can send this question to our email address, uh, podcast at blizzardwatch.com with the subject line podcast of Blizzard Watch so we know it's for this show. Or a lot of you can do what you've been doing lately and just say it's for everything. And then Joe and I get to fight over it. Uh, this week I dazzled him with a discussion of multi-tuberculates and then I grabbed a whole bunch of stuff while he wasn't looking. It's true. It happened. You can listen to it on the pre-show. Also, though, if you don't want to use, send an email for whatever reason, we do have two channels on our Discord. There's the Patron Q and Podcast Questions channel. So we know, essentially, uh, you can get in there as a patron and, and get your question asked. Uh, we, we like that, too, because you guys help pay for everything and we want to give back because, you know, having things paid for so we can keep doing them. Uh, but if you can't be a patron, we understand. Times are tough. Life is weird. So you can go to the Q and Podcast Questions channel for, you know, just about anybody. It's It's open. And we do look there as well. So we've got multiple questions. This week, I'm just going to ask Liz to read the first email. Ah! <laughs> was not prepared for this. Sorry, were you drinking something? You are probably drinking something. Uh, well, no, I was, in, I was in another tab reporting someone in World of Warcraft. Um, uh, no big deal. No big deal. Just, uh, you know, advertising things they should not be advertising. Hey, here is a familiar name up for our first question. Question for the podcast. I, your friend Roxy, have have a complaint and a question for the podcast. I was happily running Mythic Plus to try out the new season. And while there's probably some tuning to be done, the experience was tolerable. That is until I ran into the abomination that is Temple of the Jade Serpent. <laughs> I'm sorry. I take, I take from that yeah, sound that yeah, you have please, run Temple of the Jade Serpent. Please, yes. yes, please continue. Okay. Temple is the first pre-Warlords dungeon they added to the rotation. And outside of the visual that is Temple... It's a completely new dungeon. There are new trash mobs everywhere, and they completely redid the Wise Mari encounter. The dungeon is essentially a new dungeon. It felt wrong to me. Mythic Plus has had that piece where the dungeons feel familiar, and they're modified by the affixes. This is something else. To make matters worse, there is no decision-making for pathing, as you have to kill every trash mob to get full count to finish the dungeon. I'm guessing it has something to do with there being no mythic difficulty in these pre-Warlords dungeons that they completely redid the dungeon. In my opinion, they should have not selected Temple if it needed this many changes to it. I will add that three Warlords dungeons they've done so far are essentially not changed. Shadow Moon Burial Grounds, Iron Docks, and Grimrall Depot. What are your thoughts on what Mythic Plus should be for these old dungeons and if pre-Warlords dungeons make sense? if they need this much change. And I'm going to throw that one to Joe since Joe <laughs> apparently has thoughts. Yeah. So this is the thing. Um, I, hopefully, hopefully you're still my friend after this, Roxy. Um, I like that they did this change and this is pretty, pretty divisive. I like the old dungeons. I like the idea of going back to pre warlords or drain or dungeons and giving them a facelift to slot them into the rotation for mythic plus. And I think it makes sense to give them that update during that. Um, let 
you can definitely shove all of the current dungeons into a Mythic Plus rotation from the current expansion, but I like the idea of going back to those older ones. I like the idea of bringing them forward and updating that content, and that's a ton of work for them to do. Uh, don't get me wrong, but I just I really enjoy it. And you're absolutely right. Temple of the Jade Serpent is in a weird spot. So for those of you that didn't do it at, at the appropriate level, Temple of the Jade Serpent gave you an option to basically go right or left and then go through a series of encounters till you got to the very end where you had the big showdown in the, the courtyard in the middle and then fought a shot, right? No spoilers. It, the dungeon's been out for you know a number of years at this point. But for mythic plus that's not always a good thing to have choice and so it's an interesting change to force you into a path now that dungeon in in for all of its fond memories was always super light on trash always some of the trash hit really hard back in the day but it was super sparse super light there was lots of areas with just empty space running you could complete that dungeon in seven or eight minutes at one point, I know this because the guild that I was in at the time uh, was pushing that as quickly as we could to reset it, to go and push it again, to reset it, to go and push it again, to hit your five lockouts to gear, because that was the only place you could get a very specific caster weapon that we were gearing people up for server first raids, right? Adding the mobs in, slowing down the pace of it, I think is actually a really good idea. I think it it does change the way that the dungeon feels, but that's fine because Mythic Plus isn't trying to give you the same feeling as the original dungeon, right? So it's it's a good change, and I would actually like to see them go through some of the older dungeons, bring them forward, and evaluate them like this. Is that something that's worth the time and effort being put into them? Is that something that is worth updating and bringing forward as like uh, you know a beloved dungeon gets moved forward? Remember, you know, we got... Karazhan got moved up and that was super fun when we got to, you know, go into a mythic, uh, mythic Karazhan and do all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, did it feel like the original raid? No, it was a completely different everything, but it was still fun. There's room for it. So the reason I was laughing is because this is a very temple of the Jade serpent is a very divisive dungeon right now. People either really love it or really hate what they did with it. I am in the camp of really love it. So that's my two cents. My take is this, and I people are going to think this is a joke, I'm, and it's not. I am completely, 100% serious. I would like them to go back to original WoW and take all those dungeons and make them into Mythic Plus, put them in the rotation, but the original version only. Maradon but, Mythic but, Plus, uh, yes! Yeah, but when I say the original version only, I don't mean... Like, you know, the same mob density or whatever. I think that they should change things in terms of mobs and so forth. I just think that they should, like, for instance, give a sunken temple with the original layout and try and make a timer on that. Can you imagine <laughs> the, the timer is timer timer. three days. <laughs> yeah. Timer for sunken temple, temple of Atal Hakar. Go ahead and, and try to get a time run on that. You got to do the basement too. Yeah. You got to do the basement too. Go ahead. Let's see what you got. Um, the original uh, Stratholme. I, and it's not that the new Stratholme is bad. And I don't even know if any people, if many people realize that it is different now. Like Stratholme in vanilla is a completely different beast from Stratholme today. In Cataclysm, they significantly changed that dungeon. One of the things they did was get rid of the ability to go from one wing to the other while staying inside the, the dungeon. They turned them into two separate dungeons. Originally, Stratholme was just one big dungeon. You could go from the, like one section to the next just by going through a gate. And I would love to see, that's my biggest problem with Mythic Plus Dungeons is because they're timed, because they're more recently designed, they tend to be lacking in the scope that I really liked about Dungeons yeah, you, before. You know, what, let's bring up, let's bring back Upper Black Rock Spire, but let's make it a 10 man instead of a five man dungeon and let's make it Mythic Plus. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, I, I would be down I for that. Upper Black Rock Spire was originally was it aware. 15? 15 it was 15 yeah. for the very first yeah because i remember a 15 person been. raid i mean i i really miss the original upper black rock spire and if i went back you know 15 years ago and said this to myself that one day i would miss running upper black rock spire i would think <laughs> i would not I would not have believed that. Not in a million years would I have believed that because you ran Upper Black Rock Spire just 
thousands of times. I was, ran it over yeah. and over on every character nonstop. I was a pro and, warrior with the ring, with the seal that got you in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I literally went on like 10 upper black rock spire runs a day. Yep. <laughs> People would not let me log <laughs> off. I'm like, I need to go get something to eat. Oh man. We really need a tank for upper black rock spire. Are you kidding me on this? All right. They're never kidding. They're Fine. Never kidding. And, and then, of course, since we'd have a priest, I would have to be the enforcer on the yes, we're doing the Father Flame encounter. And everyone would be like, no, I don't want to do Father Flame. Like, the healer is coming for that encounter. Do you think they will stay if they don't get it? I want you to think about this. So, yeah, I would have been right with you 15 years ago saying, are you crazy? I'll never miss it. And I do miss it. I yeah. do. I miss Upper Black Rock Fire. I miss the original Doom Saw. I missed kiting. Uh, that what was his name. Not Worm Dracosath. Drac I miss kiting Dracosath yeah. out of the room so you could kill a lot. When, when you had when you had to have the when you had to have the hunters being specifically trained to do that if the tank couldn't. Yeah. Yep. Although I actually did kite him myself. Uh, I, I it was had, a rare I breed of tanks that were able to do that at the time too because he hit hard. Super hard. Oh, he hit like a truck. Uh, not just that he hit hard, but because back then the only really viable tanks were warriors and guardian druids. No, not well. I mean, and not not for horde side. For this, yeah, for this, uh, shaman could do it to a limited degree, yeah. and paladins could do it to a limited degree. But um, I'm saying for this purpose, really, it was only a warrior or a guardian druid. And guardian druids could sh could shape shift and run fast if they were if they could do it before Dracosath caught up to them. But as a warrior, your only move was to just run away <laughs> and you you had no speed buffs no heroic leaping uh charge there was no inter intervene where you could like target somebody else and charge to them none of that you just ran and so i managed to do that like uh, the, the, like i just got so good at predicting what he'd do just from experiencing it over and over again that i could do it but oh my god i hated it and yet now I miss it. I miss doing it. I miss I miss the Ren Blackhand encounter with all those whelps. He, honestly, like part of it is I just I want to see how a 10 or 15 person timed run would look. And we talked about this before with like having like uh keystones essentially for raids, which is what they kind of did with Faded, right? Mm -hmm. And that I had a lot of fun with that. I don't know about you, Liz. I thought those were were great. Like I thought they were. Tons I thought of fun. it was fun. Yes. So like taking some of those older encounters, making them ten man timed uh, dungeons, I think would be fairly fun, and it would be Are chaos, it with... and it would be fresh for a lot of for a lot of players, right? A lot of players never experienced mm -hmm. that. And if you wanted to do them like a ten or fifteen man, there are three dungeons you could do that with with minimal changes. The original strat, which had a, a ten person limit, you could bring ten people in. The original Sholamonts which you could bring 10 people in and the upper and lower black rock spire, which had a 15 person cap. And technically you could bring that many, you could bring a lot of people into black rock depths. Yep. Because originally you had to bring them into black rock depths in order to get to the molten core portal. Mm -hmm. So people like were actually running 40 people through there just to get to the portal. Uh, and I'm what I like to call, cut. yeah. And what I like to call, the the worst day any black rock dwarf ever had <laughs> dark iron dwarfs like oh god 40 people are like they don't have time for you shorty uh, uh, and for those of you that and for those of you that weren't along during that time frame uh the shortcut that they wound up putting in was you jumped through the window of a bastion into a pit of lava and yes. wound up in molten core mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was the shortcut <laughs> mm -hmm. because people were like tired of running entire 40 person raids uh through <laughs> through black rock deaths but anyway I think what we're saying here, Padilla, is that we kind of agree with you, but we kind of don't. Um, in that, it's not the, the redesign. I think it's the tuning for Jade uh, yeah. for Temple. Because we we my I have right now a, a Temple uh, Mythic Keystone, and so far everyone in my guild is like, no, thank you. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely think it's the tuning more than it is the idea of changing it around. And I definitely don't think they should avoid doing them just because they'd have to make a lot of changes. Uh, but I would like to see them do with them and not make as many changes I, just in terms of the scale, like not mythic changes, actual changes that were made in later expansions. Like I really miss the original uh, Scarlet. Uh, I want to say Scarlet Temple, but that's not it. It's the Scarlet, Scarlet Monastery. Monastery. Yeah. Scarlet Monastery. I miss the original Scarlet Monastery with the four wings and the weird stuff like that. That that dungeon was so weird. 
it was so weird and I, and I miss it and I'd like to do it again. And I, I don't like the changes they made to it. So, but yeah, I guess we should move on to the next one. Uh, I'm going to read it because we're, we're getting lower on time. So I'm going to try and read this one. Uh, this one's from Matthew Burkett. I haven't kept up with the podcast all that much, so I don't know if this has been addressed already, but I had a small epiphany. I wanted your thoughts on. For years, people wondered about the statue of a man in the Emerald Dragon Shrine in Dragonblight and what it was supposed to be. The one Ysera is sleeping on top of. They show up a few more places in the game too, always in druidy or green dragon flighty areas. Even in that unfinished Emerald Dream expansion area. Uh, just just a thing. We'll, t- we'll discuss what that is once this is done. Uh, fast forward to Dragonflight, and we have Watcher Karanos and all the other Watchers that look like him. I think this is a really nice touch to have the stone Watchers of the Dragon Isles look somewhat like those statues as a callback to a lingering mystery we've had for a while. Or am I off base here and they don't look like him at all? So, uh, thoughts, Joe? Uh, so... I thought it was intentional and I thought it, and this might be retconning or whatever the case is. I kind of took it as the dragon flights who were longing for home. Cause this is a whole theme throughout dragon flight, right? As you're going through the expansion, as you're questing with them, as you're talking with them, as you're learning about, you know, their lives a little bit more uh, again. And I will say this every single podcast, sit and talk with Varys Ross. Um, you get this idea that they've been longing for home for longer than any of us have been alive. It's been lost to them for thousands of years. So them trying to recreate uh, images or iconography that was reminiscent of back home is a perfectly normal thing that people would do. Right. If I can't quite remember how the head went, but I think it was something like this. Uh, and they find comfort in it and, and things like that. It's it's fascinating to me because it's a very – Matt, I talked about this on Lore Watch this week, and you should really listen to it for nothing more than that. It's it's very mortal of them, right? These aren't perfect recreations. These aren't, these aren't Titanic creations. These aren't uh, Titan Forge that they've made themselves because they don't know how to make them. Right. They don't they're not Titans. They're not they're not watchers. They don't have access to that particular machinery. But this is a close approximation to it. So I always took it as now having seen where we are and who those uh, watchers like the Coronos was. uh, I think it was their attempt at having a little remembrance of home. Liz, do you have anything you want to say on that one or are you pretty much good? I'm afraid not. This is, you know, we've wandered into too much lower territory for me to have any coherent thoughts on if you want to look at the original statue i put it in uh the uh podcast channel just so it would be there if you wanted to look at it i honestly hadn't thought of this and i feel like i should have i'll be up front this does feel like a very mad thing actually yeah i i didn't think of it and i really do feel like i should have but i went and looked at the the uh, statues in question and they don't they're not exactly perfect they don't they're not like it's not like here's coronos he looks just like it Mm -hmm. but I could see, like, even if that wasn't their intention, you could certainly make a good case for it. Like, it's the kind of thing that could be a fan theory that becomes lore if they, if the people of Blizzard hadn't thought of it already. I could see them sitting around going, oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, sure, that's what it is. Because um, that's happened with other games. Uh, and I do like it, though. I do I do like the idea, even if it isn't what they intended. I, I like the idea that they basically have these these remembrances of the place that they were most at home. Um, and it's kind of funky because the green dragon flight in particular don't have a lot of watchers around their actual places. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would have a hard time. Like one possibility was that this isn't even something that they necessarily wanted to put up, but the other dragons are dreaming about home <laughs> and their dragon. Yeah. Their it's like it's dreaming. distorted, distorted through the lens of a dream. Right. Yeah, so you can imagine them being like trying to like deal with the dreams of of all dragon kind wanting to go home, and that their job is the Emerald Dragonflight to police dreams and to effectively keep them from becoming nightmares and stop the the old gods from getting in through that way. So, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff to this. Uh, but it, I I do feel kind of sad that I didn't think of it. Uh, but. Okay, I guess that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, Joe, Liz, anything else to say on anything before we move on? Uh, no. Joe? I've said my piece. Then now say the other piece. 
I absolutely will. Because, friends, did you know that Blizzard Watch is made possible due to generous contributions at patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch? Your continued support means that this podcast site and community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, better chance at having your question answered on our podcast with a queue, and an ads-free site experience. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, we didn't have time to do this because it wasn't necessarily top news, but I, I wanted to throw this out here as kind of a last ditch question for you, for both of you. So I'm going to start with Liz. Have you done much or anything with crafting this expansion so far? Uh, yes, some, what I are still your thoughts? don't, I was just, I was just thinking I put a lot of time and effort into crafting and somehow I still don't really understand how it works or what's happening here. There's just, it's a whole unique system of advancement and gearing that's really interesting. Um, it's a lot more difficult to get through, but I'm sure that's intentional because they're trying to make it sort of a deeper system, a system that has more meaning and uh, kind of weight to it. Uh, so I've been enjoying it. I've been, like I said, I've been putting a lot of time into it, trying to level up, trying to get better at it. But man, a lot's going on here. Some of these things cost a lot of materials. Um, yeah, like when you find out something I, but costs like 300 it. chaos or whatever, yeah. Uh, there, is, there is one thing that I just farmed for, these uh, elemental souls, this fiery yeah. soul thing. And okay, to get this, you need to get an, a soul extractor that's created by an engineer. And then you need to get a soul container that's created by a jewel crafter. And you put these two things together and you go and kill elite elementals. And you have to use this engineering device to drain their souls while they're dying. Like, you know, the classic warlock drain soul, soul shard creating thing. But it has to, you have to do that while they're dying and it's a channel. And if you do anything else, it interrupts the channel. So you really need, you need a group, a cooperative group to manage doing this. Uh, and or, after that, or totem snap aggro. Have, yeah, well, no, but it needs to die. Like it needs to die while this is channeling and it doesn't do any damage. So like you need dots or you need a pet or you need a friend <laughs> because, and I do not, I, the only thing I have there is friends. I hope but you uh, possibly have, you possibly have uh, oh, what the heck, consecration. But then I realized it would wear off. So yeah, never mind. Yeah, I mean, consecration is uh, seven thousand damage over twelve seconds for me. And you'd have to you'd you have know, to literally kill the heck out of this guy and just he just have yeah, you, he would have to be at like one percent health, and then you cast consec consecration to hope you can cast the other thing before he dies. Yeah. yeah. So after doing all of that, you get its soul in a jar, basically, and it turns the jar into this thing with a 15 minute cooldown with like a 15 minute duration. And you have to wait till the end of that 15 minute duration and it turns into a different thing. And then you have to open it and it may or may not have the soul you need for crafting inside. And uh, the item also has a 15 minute cooldown. So you have to wait You've got to fight this elite elemental, channel this thing on it when it dies, and then you have to wait for 15 minutes to see if you actually got the item you were trying to get. Uh, it's a little crazy. I spent about an hour, hour and a half maybe, doing that earlier today. Joe? That's crafting in a nutshell. Uh, same question, Joe. Uh, have you done much with crafting, and what yep. are your thoughts? Uh, I like the vast majority of it. Uh, this is it's more in-depth and better than I had anticipated. I like that there feels like there's more to do. Like I'm actually invested in leveling my uh, skills instead of just sitting there and letting them fester because somebody else is just going to go do them. Like I'm coordinating with other jewel crafters in the guild to figure out where we can spend our points and for right now to make the best effect of it. And it feels a lot more interactive in that way. And I think it's really great. The only thing I hate is I just got done clearing my bags out. I literally just made room. I just made an effort to stop being a wow hoarder. And now you're going to give me three different qualities of the same crafting material in varying amounts. And I understand, yes, there is the intent that you will uh, take some of the older ones or the, the lower quality ones and convert them into like something else in the case of like jewel crafting, like gem dust. But my brain doesn't work like that. I make stuff when I need it to make other stuff. Otherwise, it just sits in my bag. That's my only complaint. There's just so much. There's so much stuff. But it's a lot of fun, actually. And they, they said they wanted to make a, uh, you know, 
professions feel more involved and fun and have value. I think they did. I think- yeah, I I agree with that absolutely. Um, my answer to the, my own question would basically be that I've I've actually gotten to the point where I'm using my professions to gear my character, mm-hmm. which I have not done since I think the end of Warlords. Oh yeah, if if yeah. for earlier for me, yeah. Like and I mean, like for instance, I got right now I have two level seventy warriors, another sixty eight, and one who's like just hit sixty three. Um, they're all like my first one is geared up. He geared up originally through, through blacksmithing. And the thing about it that was really cool was that I, I got one of those world quests that gives you the item that can enhance your, your, your weapon. So I made my weapon just using blacksmithing, uh, an item like three item level three seventy eight item just through that path. It started Mm -hmm. out at item level three forty. And then I upgraded it to 359 and then I upgraded it to 378. And I like that there's a lot of depth that you can specialize in stuff. Like I think this particular character has like uh, blacksmithing, weaponsmithing, hafted weapons. And when you get hafted weapons high enough, you get like a really good legendary, not legendary, a really good epic that you can craft. That's basically the, at the level of uh, like late normal mode gear. And I think you can upgrade them past that even. So there's there's a ton of flexibility to this, and I'm actually really interested in it. It is, however, very confusing. I still don't understand half of it. Um, I just learned the thing about continuing to upgrade stuff, and I'm like, oh, okay, oh, that's interesting. So yeah, I definitely think it's a it's an interesting change, and they did obviously did a lot of work to make it feel different and distinct. So kudos on that. But with that, that's going to be the end of the show. So guys, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I want to extend thanks to both Liz and Joe for being here and putting up with very long winded rambles about prehistoric mammals before we even do the podcast. Cause man, that thing was nuts. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys for being here. This has been the blizzard watch podcast and we'll be back next week. <laughs>